Okay. Good morning, everybody. I hope you all have you all had a blessed week and welcome to our Sunday service. Uh, and I'll be the host of the service as well as the leader for today. Um, and yeah, we really welcome you. And as per CDC tradition, let's take let's take a few moments to uh, do a virtual greeting to everybody. <laughs> so everybody. Hi everybody. Yeah, I'll invite you all to turn on your cameras as well if you all if you all want to see each other. My one. All right. Uh, so as we begin the service, may I also um, invite you all to uh, mute your mute yourself, uh, not your video, but your voices, um, as we go into a time of worship. But before that, uh, let us go into a word of prayer. Come. First. Uh, Lord, um, thank you for the wonders of technology, Lord. We thank you that even though we are physically separated, that our hearts and our spirits are all united together in your body as a church, Lord, through the wonders of technology. We're all here to be able to worship you today. Lord, I pray that uh, you grant protection over every single family in CDC, Lord, that um, none, none, of them will be, none of them will be affected by, by COVID-19, Lord. Uh, that everybody will be happy and healthy in the comforts of their homes, Lord. I pray for this service. I pray that it goes smoothly, that uh, no technical error should, should occur between the, whether it's the media team, Lord, or the, or the worship leader, Lord. I pray that this, uh, this service goes as smoothly as possible. I pray that you anoint the speaker with your wisdom, Lord, that you may deliver your message so that it reaches our hearts, Lord. I pray for uh, myself, the worship leader, Lord. I pray that my singing will be pleasing to your ears and pray for uh, the future week ahead that uh, you know that you're in control of this situation this pandemic Lord that that you will um, that you will you will, you will act on it Lord and that you will, you will bring healing to this world Lord. all this in your name that we ask for in Jesus name I pray amen all right uh, excuse me for one moment <laughs> Right, shall we go into a time of praise and worship? Our first song, I've Got Peace. Shines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. 
well with our souls, Lord. Know that uh, you are in control of everything, Lord, that we may rest on you, Lord, that uh, you will take care of everything, Lord. All this in your name we pray. Amen. And thank you, everyone. And now I'd like to pass it over to uh, Elder Chang Keng Kiang to give a prayer on uh, the COVID-19 situation in our country. Okay. Uh... Do I have my PowerPoint on the screen? Get my view correct, please. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I think it's also very appropriate today as on Sunday we want to remember and, and pray and also to give thanks to God for all that he has done to all of us and again we are still in the midst of this whole pandemic and I think again we want to be reminded of how great our God is. It is proven again that human can never outperform the creator. All the less the, we boast anything about it tomorrow let us be thankful for our past achievements and be hopeful for our future plans. But never forget to acknowledge God. It is wise to make plans. But it is wiser to know the Lord's purpose in our lives and to surrender our plans to Him. As in Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails at the end of the day. How true? Because today we find that many countries are trying to invent all the vaccine they can to overcome this, this coronavirus. But above all this, God's plan is still intact and God's plan is going to be executed, whatever it takes. Yeah. So let's be reminded to, to focus our attention to the creator of this whole universe and in our country. Next slide, please. Let's focus and ask God, the Lord's divine intervention, and to bring healing to Malaysia. We have not out of this whole pandemic yet. We are still in the midst of storm, but we continue to ask the Lord's divine intervention to bring healing to our country. And the wisdom for the nation's leaders to find measures and practical solutions to contain the pandemic. Of late, we see a lot of controversial, but let us ask God to again grant them wisdom to take us through this pandemic. And thirdly, for the riot, including all of us here, to stay safe, stay at home, and be proactive to curb the spread of the disease. Good news that we many of us are already been vaccinated, but let's remember that there are so, still many out there. So let's stay, stay safe, stay at home, and proactive to curb the spread of the disease. And finally, this is a time for us not to do anything else but to fix our eyes onto Jesus, our Lord. This is the key that I want to share with you. 
because around us, just like in the storm, around us, there are things that are happening around us are not good to us. They keep us, give us worries, give us anxieties, but let us fix our eyes onto Jesus and everything will be in place. Yeah. Okay, let's pray together. Dear Lord, as the coronavirus affects the world and our country, Malaysia, we want to continue to pray for the people of this land. We want to invite you into our hearts, Lord, hearts that have been filled with worries and fear right now. Amidst our fear, disappointment, confusion, uncertainty, grief, anger, frustration, and many more. We want to invite you in, Lord. We know you are bigger and stronger. May we be given the peace beyond our understanding as we go through these difficult times. May we act with humility to not just preserve our own safety and health, but to look beyond ourselves and think of how our actions will affect others. May we be alert to the ways we may help those around us and give us the grace to step forward without hesitation to be men and women that would do just like our Lord Jesus did. Come, O oh Lord, come to help us. Open our ears to hear your voice in these troubled times. May we listen and be prudent, and may we draw ever closer to you. Open our eyes, Lord, open our eyes, and fix our eyes onto Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We want to commit and pray all this in the Lord's precious name. Amen. Thank you, Elder King Kiang. And now I'd like to pass it over to Pastor Chin for the announcements. Yeah. Hi, good morning, Church. It's good to connect with you, uh, even this morning through Zoom. Thank you, Brother Gidget, for leading us in time of worship. Thank you for the songs. Uh, quite appropriate at this time, especially pandemic, to have the peace of God, to have the love of God, to have the joy of God in our hearts. And uh, so to be able to say that it is well in, uh, in my soul or with my soul, even though going through this challenging time. And thank you also, Elder Ken Kiang, for the prayer that we utter uh, for the nation. It is important for us right now to be able to continue to pray for our nation. Uh, talking about prayer, uh, the first announcement is that we will, uh, every Sunday, we have our pre-service prayer meeting at 9.15 a.m. I would, I, would, I would like to encourage all of us here who have not been regular or have not attended the prayer meeting before to come attend the prayer meeting and join us together to pray for our nation, to pray for our church, to pray for ourselves, and to pray for the world. Knowing that at this time, we need to continue to persevere on because the number of cases are still very high. And uh, but thank God, you know, the cases are coming down, especially in our nation. Uh, but we continue to press on and pray together as a church. And we join our hearts together with the churches around us in Malaysia, in the world as well, to, to pray that, that, that the pandemic will come down. Yeah, and also uh, God's purposes be, uh, be accomplished. Next announcement is about Father's Day. Yeah, on the 20th of June, we are celebrating the Father's Day, right? So it is invitation to every one of us here, especially fathers. And, uh, and also uh, Dr. Living Lee is our speaker. He's speaking on the topic, Super Dad. Yeah, for those of us who are friends, yeah, please invite them to join us. Let us celebrate together. And for those of us, where parents or fathers who are uh, yet to know Christ, yeah, invite them as well too. And also for those of us who have friends who are Christians, but they are not attending any church at the moment, yeah. especially uh, fathers, yeah. bring them as well too. Now, when we talk about fathers, it's not only biological fathers. We still talk about spiritual fathers. Yeah, we also talk about grandfathers. We still talk about foster fathers, adopted fathers as well too. Yeah, so... Matter status is one thing, but more importantly is that if you are fathering someone, whether biologically, whether spiritually, or whether in whatever way, invite them. 
yeah, there's a word for them. And Dr. Lee will share something with us. Yeah. All right. The next announcement is about worshiping our Lord through giving. Yeah, the giving to the church or giving to our Lord is a form of worship. And uh, even as the Lord blesses us with many good things, the ability to earn income and the gifts that are given to us. Yeah, let us give back to the Lord a portion of what He has given to us. And the account number is on the screen. You can do so by letter it transfer or back in their check, or even uh, to, to go to ATM and then transfer over as well too. Yeah, if you should need any information, please contact our brother Tobin Kit, who is his, the treasurer of our church, and the email is stated on the screen. All right, before we carry on with the message, let us go to give thanks to the Lord uh, in prayer for our offering. Shall we pray together? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace and mercy. We are reminded of your goodness to us. And even as we come before this time, giving back to you a portion of what you've given to us, we pray that you continue to give wisdom to our church leadership to disperse these funds for the furtherance of your kingdom, for the blessing of the society around us. May you continue to guide and lead us. Father, even as we consider your word this morning, Lord, speak to us through your word. Let us not only be hearers only, but also be doers only as well too. That even as we hear your word, for we say in your word, Lord Jesus, that if you hold on to my truth, the truth will set you free. Lord, so Father, help us. You really hold on to your truth, that we may practice your truth and be set free by your truth, Lord. So lead and guide us with me as I speak. May the words that from my mouth will be your words, O oh Lord Jesus. I will not return to you void because you are worthy. We praise and worship and honor. We thank you and praise you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Right. The topic for today is, uh, or rather say, uh, is Salus Prayer. The three Sundays ago, we begin a series on building our prayer life. And we talk about how God, God's people, Pray during crisis times. We started with the topic wrestling in prayer, where Jacob faced a crisis with his, with his elder brother Esau. He prayed to God, and God wrestled him and transformed him into a better man. From Jacob, he was renamed Israel. Last Sunday, on the topic desperate prayer, the nation of Israel faced the crisis of invasion by a huge and formidable enemy. King Jehoshaphat and the people of Israel fasted and prayed to God for help and God defeated their, their enemies and delivered them. Today, we will consider the final topic, Sabbath prayer, where the people of Israel had left Egypt not too long and are now facing a crisis of destruction. What will happen to them? Let us read the scriptures together that talks about this incident. It is found in Exodus chapter 20, 32, verses 1 to 33. Okay, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed, to come down from the mountain, the people gathered to them, themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of the gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from the head and fashioned it in, with a graving tool and make a golden calf. And he said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, they built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go now, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Therefore, now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn up hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom we have brought out of the land of Egypt, with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, 
with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you saw by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But, he said, it is not a sound of shouting for victory or the sound of pride or defeat, but the sound of singing that I heard. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burnt it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did these people do to you that you have brought such great sin upon them? And Moses said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought up us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Let anyone have go, take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. And, Moses, and when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses took the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kills his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you. The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for you. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, these people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of, gods of gold. But now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please block me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Never, nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord set a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. The people of Israel was facing a crisis. A crisis that they didn't know that was going to happen to them. A crisis of their own making. Just to give you a little context by, by saying a little of the background that had led to this crisis. If we book the, read the book of Exodus, you will find that the Israelites were under the bondage of slavery in Egypt. They were oppressed by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They cried out to God for help, and God sent 10 miraculous plates to force Pharaoh to let them go. Finally, Pharaoh let them go, and Moses brought them out of Egypt and led them towards the Promised Land. They had now crossed the Red Sea, where God parted the sea so that they could walk across the sea on dry ground. After crossing the Red Sea, Moses led them to Mount Sinai. And this is where they were. At Mount Sinai, God revealed himself to them with flashes of lightning, loud thunders, and loud blasts of ram's horns. It was an awesome sight for them. And God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments and other related laws. God made a covenant with them to take them as his redeemed people and he be their God. The Israelites agreed to the covenants and they pledged total loyalty to God and total obedience to God for all the commands that God has spoken to them. And God also invited Moses, Aaron, and his sons, together with 70 elders, for a covenant 
for a covenant meeting with him to eat and drink before him. God had written down his laws for the people on tablets of stone, and he called Moses up the mountain to give Moses the tablets of stone. So Moses, together with Joshua, went up the mountain. Joshua stopped halfway up the mountain, while Moses went high up to meet with God. Moses was in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. That was when this incident happened, and that led to what the crisis began to brew. Now, there are four things that I'd like to share from Exodus chapter 32. There are many things, even as you study this book, this, this chapter is a very rich chapter about God, Israel, and Moses. Yeah, about leadership, about loving God, about who God is. Yeah, but I just want to share four things with you this morning. The first thing is that God's wrath against Israel's idolatry in verses 1 to 10. Verse 1 tells us that Moses was delayed in coming down from the mountain. And the people of Israel were wondering what had happened to him. So they became impatient because they wanted to see a lead leader to move them forward. What they did is that they gathered together and went to Aaron and set up, said to him, Up, make us gods. Now the words up and make in Hebrews are imperatives. That means that they are demanding Aaron, not asking him, but demanding Aaron to make gods to lead them in their journey forward. And Aaron agreed. Probably Aaron felt the pressure as well too, that people come against him. He might also be wondering why his brother Moses, the main leader of the people of Israel, was taking so long in coming down from the mountain. Without Moses around, he became fearful of the people and he gave in to their demand. He then instructed them to give them their gold earrings. And with the old gold ornaments, Aaron mounted them and used it to make a golden calf. He then presented to the people, and when the people saw it, they declared, These are the gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. They are replacing God with an idol. And when Aaron saw what happened, he joined them. He would, he would probably felt flattered that they liked his creation of the golden calf. And also, since he could not stop them, he might as well join them. And he made it big for himself by living in the idolatry. He sanctioned the worship of the golden calf. He built an altar and proclaimed a worship service to be held the following day. And the people got up early for the worship service. There was a great celebration. In verse 6, it tells us that they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the, people, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. They not only eat and drink. The word rose up to play when translated from the Hebrew word sahak is the tasteful way of saying that they were indulging in sexual immorality. The Israelites, in worshipping the idols, rejected God as their, as their God. Instead of trusting God, they were looking to the idols that they had made to guide them regarding their future. The idolatry was in spite of the wonderful experience they had of God. God answered their prayers. God delivered them. God provided them with food. God defeated their enemies. And God's presence was in the pillars of cloud by day and pillar of night by a pillar of fire by night. And the awful presence of God at Mount Sinai was there as well, too. And the elders also ate and drank in the presence of God. The idolatry was also in despite of the Ten Commandments and laws they have received from God a few weeks before. Where in the second commandment, God has forbidden them to worship idols in multiple forms and warned them of punishment for disobedience. The idolatry was also, despite of Israelites have pledged their loyalty and total obedience to God twice after receiving God's law. They said, all things, all that the Lord God has said, we will do. They said that twice to God but yet they had broken God's law. They had not only broken the second commandment in, the second commandment in, doing, in practicing idolatry, but in practicing sexual immorality, they had also broken the seventh commandment that says, you shall not commit adultery. What about Aaron? Aaron knew more than Israelites. He had assisted and also accompanied Moses in most of Moses' encounter with Pharaoh and with God. However, Aaron, as the leader, 
who should have stopped the people from sinning, give in to the people's demand and let them astray. Now, when all these things were happening, Moses didn't know. But God saw what was happening. God, being through his word, wanted to punish Israel for the sin of idolatry. However, before he would do that, God told Moses that Israel had sinned and Israel had corrupted themselves by disobeying God's command, made themselves an idol and worship it. And God told Moses, the root of this idolatry, of this sin, is actually the being stiff-necked. Stiff-necked is another word for stubbornness. It's, it is derived from a situation where the farmer would plow the field, and the ox were used to plow the field, and when one wanted to turn, the ox refused to turn. Yeah, so it's that strong in a sense. Yeah, it is their refusal to learn and change despite of all the experiences that God has given to them. Therefore, God was very angry with Israel. He told Moses to leave him alone so that he could destroy them. And then he would, he would make Moses into a great nation. Why is God so angry with idolatry? Idolatry is a grievous sin in God's sight. Idolatry is replacing the worship of God in our lives with something else. It is rejecting God as the Lord of our lives and let other things control the way we live. Now, while we may not worship calf image like the Israel's golden calf, more than this idol can take many forms and can be more subtle. It can be money, it can be sex, it can be power, it can be people like worshipping a celebrity, a family member, or a church leader, or a certain hobby, or even our own self. Idolatry is not just rejecting God. Just like Israel's idolatry had led Israel to sexual immorality, idolatry will lead us to other sins eventually also. As believers in Christ, we need to be very careful that what we profess God in our lives we do not let things of this world replace God as the Lord of our lives and forfeit God's blessing for our lives. God will have destroyed Israel for the idolatry, if not for Moses taking an immediate action. This, this leads me to my second point. Moses sells prayer for God's name in verses 11 to 14. Moses did not want to leave God alone. When God said he wanted to destroy Israel, he immediately interceded on behalf of Israel. Here we see a selfless Moses. Instead of being happy to receive God's blessing to make him a, into a great nation and be an ancestor of a great nation, he declined it immediately and pleaded with God to spare the wayward Israelites. How did Moses intercede? He appealed to the personhood of God in verses 11 to 14. Moses appealed to God's choice of Israelites as God's people, whom God has powerfully delivered from Egypt. And in verse 12, Moses appealed to God's name. If God destroyed the Israelites, the Egyptians would hear about it and think of God as a cruel God, saying that God actually led the Israelites into the wilderness to kill them and not really to liberate them. And in verse 13, Moses appealed to God's oath and covenants. God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Israel to make them a great nation and to give them the promised land. No doubt Moses was filled with compassion for the Israelites, but his main concern was for the honor of God's name. And you know what? God answered Moses' prayer. God relented and spared the Israelites. As I read through this passage itself, how Moses appeal to God personhood. I was just thinking, how did Moses learn to pray in this manner? And God answered him immediately. The only answer I can think of is, that, is this. Moses knew his God intimately. Moses knew his God intimately. Moses had walked with God since the day God called him out of the burning bush in, in Exodus chapter, chapter 3. While Moses might have faulted a number of times, Moses had been consistent in his walk with God in obedience. Whatever God has said, Moses obeyed. Even if it means difficult for him, but he made a choice to obey God. And this is no exception to Moses. Every believer in Christ 
who wants to know God in a personal and intimate manner, must also walk in obedience to Christ. Our Lord Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 21, He said, He who has my commandment and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and make myself known to him. Our faith, our Christian faith, is not a faith of do's and don'ts, although they are important to us. Our faith is a faith of revelation. And how God revealed to us, as John chapter 14, verse 21 says, that as, God, as we obey God, as an expression of our love to Him, God will show Himself more and more to us. Which means that as we obey God, we will experience Him in a very personal manner. And we go deeper and deeper into Him. And grow more and more intimate with our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ and friends, do you desire to grow intimately with God? Are you walking in obedience to Him? We can learn to pray like Moses as we read the Bible, study the Bible, memorize the verses, and not only that, but important is that while we have it in our head, we need to have it in our heart as well too. And how to have it in our heart is that we need to walk in obedience to God's word. And that is when we start to experience God in a very personal way. Now, after Moses had agreed to, and after God had agreed to Moses' prayer not to destroy Israel, Moses knew he had to take action to put things right among the Israelites. This leads me to my third point. Moses pushed Israel's idolatry. In verses 15 to 29, Moses quickly took the two tablets of commandment that God had written and went down the mountain together with Joshua to the tent. When Moses saw the golden calf and the immoral celebration, verse 19 tells us that Moses and the burnt hot and he threw the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Why did Moses break the stone tablets? Moses was adding out what Israel did. The two stone tablets were God's written law for the covenant between God and Israel. In breaking the stone tablets, Moses was adding out that Israel, in their sin of idolatry, had broken God's law and their covenant with God. So there's no point in keeping that tablet of, of stone of commandments anymore. Then he destroyed the calf and burnt it with fire to show them that the golden calf they worship as their God was actually nothing and could be easily destroyed. He also grounded the golden calf into powder, scattered it on the water, and made the people of Israel to drink as an immediate punishment for their sin. And Moses also called Aaron, his brother, to account and told him in no uncertain terms that Aaron had led the people to sin. Aaron could have stood up to the people and prevented them from their sin of idolatry, but he didn't. In another account written in Deuteronomy chapter 9, it tells us this, the Lord was very angry with Moses and would have destroyed him if Moses had not interceded for Aaron. Aaron interceded, uh, Moses interceded for Aaron to be spared by God. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, that is the importance of leadership, making a stand for God. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, meaning that there was no restraint among the people, moral, spiritual, and social anarchy was setting in, was happening, and the situation was getting out of hand. Moses knew that if these things carry on, the destruction of Israel will definitely follow. And he had to do something about it. So Moses garnered those who still, still fear the Lord and had not bowed down to the idol or who were repentant. And the Levites, uh, the Levites, the tribe that Moses belonged to, garnered it around him and he ordered them to do a cleansing, to kill those whom they knew were unrepentant, defiant, and still indulged in sexual immor 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 imm immorality, even if this unrepentant was their close relatives, their brothers, or their fathers or their grandfathers. The Levites did, and 3,000 men fell that day. 
Now the question we can, we may ask: Why is such a drastic measure? It is because what was at stake was God's wrath, and God's judgment was going to fall down upon the whole nation. When God's wrath and judgment fall down upon the whole nation, the whole nation will be annihilated. What the, the stake when the stake is high? And the nation is in serious risk of extinction, which means that the future of the nation is real at stake. The situation demands drastic measure so that the nation can be saved and ensure there is a future for the nation. How do we deal with sin in our lives? Sin are something that will destroy us eventually. Do we excuse it? Or do we see it as God sees it? How do we deal with sin in our church, in our midst? Do we close one eye and let it carry on? Or do we address it like Moses did? Are we on God's side in dealing with sin in our lives and also the sin in our midst in the church? Standing with God, meaning that we are to be strict with ourselves and to be repentant of our sins and come before God. That is for individual sin. And studying with God in the corporate area of dealing with sin means studying against some people as well too. This can be painful. It can be unpopular. But when things need to be done, it has to be done. And scripture tells us that sin contaminates us and put our lives under the judgment of God. Therefore, there should be no compromise regarding sin in the church. And our Lord Jesus Christ laid down the procedure for how to handle sin in Matthew chapter 18, which is regarding church discipline, to do it in love, gently but firmly. And because of the sin of Israel was so great, Moses felt that he had to continue to plead with God to spare Israel. That brings me to my final point, the fourth point. Moses suffers prayer for Israel's life in verses 30 to 35. Moses was struck with the depths of Israel's sin. Although God had relented from destroying them, Moses wasn't sure what God would do next. To, 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 to do next. He felt the need to further intercede for the Israelites, hopefully that the Lord would really spare them. Moses told the people that he would intercede on their behalf before God to make atonement for them, meaning to forgive, that God would forgive their sin. Notice how Moses prayed before God. He did not hide the people's sin, nor make excuse for their sin, nor rationalize their sin away, say that, oh, because he was, Moses was away for so long and that the people were wondering what had happened to him and there wasn't any word from God for them to act or to go forward. So they needed something to guide them. That's why they made the idol. No, Moses didn't reason with God. Moses knew that Israel's sin of idolatry was grievous. He admitted their sin and he named their sins specifically. That he said, the people of Israel have sinned greatly and they made a golden calf to worship. That was what Moses named the sin of Israel. No excuse, but made it as it is. He called a spade a spade, a spoon a spoon. And Moses pleaded with God to forgive Israel's sin of idolatry. And if God will not forgive them, he asked, to, he asked God to block down his name from, God, from God's good book. He was willing to trade his life as a sacrifice for the sin of the nation of Israel. Yes, God wanted to destroy Israel and make him into a nation, but he didn't want to ride on what God desired to do for him. He, Moses identified himself with his people. He offered himself as a substitute for God's punishment. Earlier, Moses pleaded with God to protect God's name. Now Moses pleaded with God to forgive Israel and spare their lives and was willing to die as a, as a substitute. Here we see a selfless Moses. But God is just. God said that he will punish those he didn't punish. He will punish and not exclude those who have sinned against him. Yeah, he will exclude these people from his book. And God is gracious and faithful. He told Moses to lead the people of Israel forward to the promised land, and he would send an angel to lead them. This was God's promise to stay faithful to Israel and to keep his presence with them, despite of Israel's 
faithfulness, uh, unfaithfulness. And God sees and knows the human heart. While God had agreed to spare the nation as a whole, he reserved the right to punish individual sinners. And God sent a plague on the Israelites. Although the Levites had done the cleansing, they only managed to deal with, with the external practices that they could see. There were hidden sinful practices that they could not see. Only God could see. And the plague was sent to punish those who practiced sin secretly or held it in their hearts. The second intercession of Moses tells us two things. The first is that there are certain things that need continuous prayer in our lives. A casual prayer or praying once or twice may not see a breakthrough. As we pray, we'll see that God is just, He's gracious and faithful. He knows the people and situation well, and He will act accordingly. The second thing is that, are we willing to give ourselves to intercession? Moses was willing to give his life for the Israelites. Are we willing to give our time and energy in interceding for important or urgent situation or for a person until there is a breakthrough? When I think of this, I was thinking of our country's situation, the worst situation of the pandemic. When it started last year in March, especially our, our, our nation, where we are locked down, a lot of Christians prayed, a lot of Jesus prayed. As a result, the numbers came down. And as the years goes by, we pray and pray and find that not and find that this the, the, the situation is still there. And we lose heart. And we 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 we, we stop praying. Some still can still, still carry on, but many of us stop praying. And what happened? The number shows up again. And now it's important for us to come together to pray. And there are many churches who actually make a call for the church to pray together as uh, as churches and as a nation as well, too. So let us continue to pray for this pandemic. It's like something that we need to pray continually and to give ourselves time and energy and wait for the God's timing to taper it down. So let us persevere in prayer. When we see some situation or we see a friend or, or brother and sister in Christ or family members who are in need, who are in a difficult situation or in sin, let us persevere on to pray for them until we see a breakthrough in their lives. God's wrath against Israel's idolatry. And Moses established prayer for God's name. Moses pushed Israel's idolatry. And Moses established prayer for Israel's life. So, brothers and sisters, that as we look into the prayer of Moses, let us continue to also pray and seek the Lord in the same manner. In the past three weeks, that we see how God's people pray during crisis. Jacob wrestled in prayer and God transformed him. King Jehoshaphat and the nation of Israel were desperate. They engaged in desperate prayer and God delivered them from a huge and formidable army. God delivered them from destruction. And as the prayer of Moses, we find that Moses averted God's wrath against the people of Israel in the sin of idolatry. God relented and forgave their sin. And how it was able, how was Moses able to pray such prayer? It's because he knew God. So, brothers and sisters in Christ and friends, may I encourage you that let us build a life of prayer, a life that we can move on forward to grow in our established prayer as well, too. And let us cultivate that intimacy with God by seeking to know God, to really know Him, love Him, and serve Him. At the end of the day, is that when we learn to, when we know God, when we truly know God, our communion with God will not only be sweet, but also we will see our prayers be answered one by one. It may mean traveling in prayer like Moses, but it also would mean that we see God answering our prayers. Let us therefore, as individuals, Cultivate intimacy with God. And let us, as a church, encourage one another to grow in intimacy with God, that we truly know God and love God and serve God. Because together, as a church, we build. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you 
that you are the God who loves us, the God who cares for us. And you put us in situation so that we can be a blessing in that situation. You put us to know people so that we can be a blessing to the people that you have put around us, especially in times of crisis. And we pray, Father, that you help us to be praying people, to persevere in praying that we may see a breakthrough in the situation or in the life of the people that we pray for. And we pray, Lord, that you grant your grace to grow in intimacy with you, to obey your word as an expression of our love for you. Know that even as we obey your word, O Lord, you will show yourself to us. That as you show yourself to us, we know, Father, that our will will also be more and more aligned to yours. And as you promise in your word, that even as our will is aligned to yours, when we pray, we are able to pray selflessly and that we can see things happening because you are pleased to answer our prayers. So grant us your grace, Father, as your people in CDC, that we be truly be people who know you and be selfless in our walk with you, in our interaction with individuals, in the church, outside the church, in our families, in our friends, our social contacts, our standard families, and also be people who pray selflessly. Help us, O God, we pray. For you are worthy. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And now shall we rise for the benediction? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Now back to our sister, our, our brother Kike. Thank you, Pastor Chin. Now the service is officially over. Uh, you may stay back for uh, the next 15 minutes if you wish to fellowship with each other. Other than that, have a good week ahead and God bless. Bye.